Hi, welcome everyone. My name is Ryan Wilson. I'm the Communications Director for the Arizona State Chapter of Normal. We've got uh, Mike Robinette, uh, who is the uh, Director of uh, Southern Arizona Normal. Uh, tonight's special edition, uh, special episode, we have uh, with us tonight uh, Logan Elia, uh, partner at the Rose Law Group, uh, Adam Trank, partner and Director of Cannabis, Hemp and Equine Law at the Rose Law Group, and Jeff Jacobs, who is a uh, U.S. Navy veteran, former state trooper, and current elected city commissioner. Uh, tonight's episode is uh, going to be geared around guns and cannabis. And with that, I'll turn it on over to Mike Robinette to talk a little bit more in depth about that. Thanks so much, Ryan. I'm very excited. I'm Mike Robinette. As Ryan mentioned, I'm, I'm the director of Southern Arizona Normal. I'm also on the board of Arizona Normal, and Ryan and I work very closely together on a regular basis in coordinating our efforts. And one of our major efforts that we're very excited to have happen this evening is our premiere episode of our new educational series. Because both Southern Arizona Normal and Arizona Normal, one of our charges relative to our bigger mission is to perform and do outreach in the community as, and, and as part of that outreach to provide education. So we've decided to create this is our premier installation, though, of a much bigger educational series that we'll be offering in the months to come relative to cannabis issues, and particularly those kind of cannabis issues that affect us as consumers. And, and, and particularly this issue, we get a lot of calls, both with Arizona Normal, Southern Arizona Normal, and people in, in conversations, this always comes up, the issue of marijuana or cannabis and guns and what are our rights? What can we do? What can we not do? And because it's been anecdotally something that we hear a lot about, we thought, what a great way to start our, 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 premier, uh, our premier instructional event with our series than to do it relative to marijuana and guns. So we want to welcome everyone. And of course, we want to thank our special guests, Logan, Adam, and Jeff for joining us. And of course, I'd like to thank Ryan for all his effort with Arizona Normal. And with, uh, without any further ado, I want to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for Marijuana and Guns, Arizona Normal, Southern Arizona Normal's first, first edition of our educational series. Thank you. And with that, uh, let's uh, go through, uh, do a brief round of introductions. Uh, and we'll, let's start with uh, Logan. I'm Logan Elia. I'm a partner at the Rose Law Group. I practice in a number of areas. I do a little bit of criminal defense. I, I practice in firearms law. I, I help people uh, acquire machine guns and silencers and stuff like that. Uh, and I also litigate on behalf of the cannabis industry. So, you know, I have a, my fingers in a number of these topics. Uh, so I'm really, uh, I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Logan. Much appreciated. Thank you for being here. Uh, Adam. Uh, my name is Adam Trank. I am uh, also a partner at the Rose Law Group, where I've been uh, chair of the uh, ca legal cannabis and hemp divisions for about a year now. Uh, and I've been working in that department for about 10 years, and of course, done some of the litigating with Logan, but also mostly on the transactional side. And I really appreciate you guys having us on this evening on your premiere episode uh, of this sort of educational uh, program. Thanks, Anna. Much appreciated. Thank you for your time. Uh, and, and Jeff, uh, take it away, Jeff. Hi, my name is Jeff Jacobs, uh, former Arizona resident of 18 years. Uh, I now live out in Florida. As a state trooper while I was there in Arizona for seven years, um, I come at things from, from many different angles and look at it uh, with open eyes, see, see the positive changes that we can do for society. Uh, currently, I'm an elected city commissioner uh, here in Florida, and um, I sit on the uh, 2020 delegation for uh, the DNC, also sit on the Public Safety and Security Legislative um, Committee for uh, the National League of Cities and Transportation of Veterans Affairs for the state of Florida. So uh, I got a lot going on around here, but um, you know, legalization of uh, marijuana here in Florida is, is another thing I'm really paying close attention to and how things are going on here. Well, thanks, Jeff. Thank you very much for uh, joining us here tonight. I know it's been a busy day for you. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, start this off with, uh, you know, some situational situations that uh, people might find themselves in, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, they could really end up in some hot water. Um, Jeff, uh, if you could speak to some of your experience uh, and, and what you've come across, that'd be great. 
I think uh, the the biggest biggest concern I would be or uh, would be someone uh, an, an individual having um, having a weapon in their car with them as they you know are also a uh, uh, a card member and they they have marijuana with them so um, they have the mix of marijuana along with drugs and getting stopped um, and pulled over so uh, I'm trying to look at what the legalities are of what, what would happen to that person they have the legal license for marijuana but they also have a weapon so where do we go from there with that and then what happens if they've got their card and, and ultimately they don't have it there to produce at the stop? You know, what, uh, you know, does that kind of play in as a, an additional factor? Um, it does, uh, I, I know there's been, been talk in some states about possessing the medical marijuana card and not being able to hold a concealed weapons um, permit at the same time. So are they still able to purchase a weapon or is there something that because they have a medical marijuana card, are they prevented from holding that weapon? So that would be, be another question I would have. Um, what, what really would be preventing them from getting the CCW? Is it just the legislation for having the card um, you know, having the card itself. Um, as we discussed earlier too, what if someone got the card, tried it, it wasn't for them. So now they're in the system of having the card, but they relinquish the card, they turn it back in. Are they automatically removed out of the system? Are they still sitting in the system? You know, what happens when they go to buy a firearm down the road? Um, and what are the consequences uh, for, for violating the laws? You know, are, are they going to be become a prohibited possessor? Is, is that something, the extent that they're going to take it to? Uh, you know, w w someone, you know, like goes hunting, they take, you know, a little alcohol with them. They take a little marijuana with them. They, they, they're card carrier, they have a weapon with them. That's a combination of three different things. You know, what's the outcome if they get stopped while they're out there? Um, and where, where does someone go to help? go to get help uh, when they're facing these type of con consequences, you know, w who do they reach out to? You know, there's, there's attorneys for everything, but in this area, you know, we're now mixing firearms with, you know, uh, marijuana and medical issues. So what type of attorney do they need? Where, where does someone reach, reach for that? So those are the type of questions I have. Yeah, and absolutely. And, and Adam, I'd uh, love uh, for you to jump in there. It looks like you've got, uh, you know, a response on that. Yeah, so I'll give a brief answer, then I can kick it over to Logan. But the short version is, is that uh, federal law prohibits the uh, purchase or possession of firearms by anybody who's an illegal user of uh, certain narcotics. That includes marijuana. And so even though it may be legal under certain state regulatory schemes, um, the federal government is not recognizing that. And so it would be illegal to purchase a firearm or to possess a firearm under federal law if you're a user of marijuana. Now there's a bit of gray area there. Um, and that gray area is, well, just because I have a medical marijuana card, in other words, it was prescribed to me, I went through the process of obtaining it. Am I in possession of marijuana or am I continuing to use it? Maybe I got the medical marijuana card a year ago used it for an injury for a couple of months, haven't been back to a dispensary in several months, and now I'm possessing a weapon. Um, but, you know, that's something that ultimately is probably going to be up to a judge to decide as, as, you know, interpreting the law. And then so the answer to Jeff's question is you, you would call us. Uh, Logan and I would help you with that. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, I've been working in this arena for as long as the uh, medical marijuana law has been on the books here in Arizona, and I've been a firearms enthusiast my whole life. And Logan, uh, his area of practice is um, more primarily in firearms, but he's also a very seasoned litigator and he has more experience in the criminal domain than I do. And so um, we're who you call. Awesome. And Logan, uh, would you like to you know dig in a little bit deeper on that? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think the, the most important thing to understand is that some of the questions that were raised are state law questions and some of them are federal law questions. Uh, and the unfortunate reality is this. Uh, if you use marijuana, you are a prohibited possessor of firearms under federal law, period, no matter what. Your card is irrelevant. Uh, 
Now, uh, whether you can get a card and get a concealed weapons permit, uh, you know, you can in Arizona. I don't know if you can in other states. Arizona's specific state law about who is a prohibited possessor of firearms makes no reference uh, to marijuana. Uh, and Arizona's uh, Medical Marijuana Act says that you cannot be denied uh, any privilege uh, by virtue of your cardholder status. So, I mean, if you, you want to have a concealed weapons permit in Arizona and you want to have a card, uh, you can absolutely do that. Uh, you know, I, I would say that if the, the, the safest legal advice uh, is you have to pick one. You, ha you have to be into marijuana or you have to be into firearms. Uh, that's, that's the only truly safe option. Uh, it, the rest of the advice is that you have, to, you have to kind of understand the way that the system functions uh, and you know, determine what your tolerance is. Uh, you know, I, I'm willing to hazard a bet uh, that some people who have marijuana cards today uh, maybe use marijuana before marijuana cards were a thing. Uh, you know, despite the fact that that was uh, not uh, a legal activity. Uh, and of course, I would encourage those people to remain silent about that fact. Uh, but, you know, it, it is probably a reality. Uh, uh, a little bit about the, the notion of a database. Uh, importantly, Arizona's medical marijuana card database uh, is considered protected health uh, information. Uh, so Arizona's database is not shared. Uh, it's not like if you go to a gun shop uh, and you fill out the form 4473 uh, and you are a card holder and you are also a user of marijuana and you mark down on question 21E, despite what it says, you say, no, I'm not an illegal user of marijuana. Uh, you, you perjure yourself on the form, it's a felony. Uh, they submit the form uh, to the NIC system for a background check. The NIC system is not tied into the card database. Uh, you know, it's not going to flag you immediately like, hey, this guy has a car. Uh, he's a liar. Go arrest him. That's that's not the way that it works. Uh, OK, so it's kind of like a by your honor type of a situation there on that question. I mean, largely, yes, uh, it's, it's by your honor under oath. Uh, you know, the the under other oath. thing is. It, so what does that mean under oath in that situation? If you actually lie and, uh, you know, uh, falsify that, uh, you know, answer on that form, uh, what does that actually, uh, you know, what kind of a situation does that put you in, legally speaking? Uh, so let's say you did something really dumb. You fill out the form 4473, you lie on it. Uh, the guy standing next to you at the gun shop is an ATF agent. You don't realize. Uh, you turn to him uh, and you say, ha ha, that's funny. Uh, they'll never catch me. They don't even know that I have a car. Here, let me show you. <laughs> uh, you get arrested uh, and you get charged with a felony and you may go to prison for up to 10 years. Uh, so that's a bad thing. Uh, I will also tell you that it, gun shops are prohibited from transferring firearms to anybody who has a card, period. Uh, they, the, the, federal, the federal government prohibits them from transferring to anybody who they have reasonable suspicion to believe is an unlawful user of marijuana. Uh, and your possession of a card is reason to suspect that you are a marijuana user. Uh, and so if you do have a card and you do buy a gun at a gun shop, uh, you would be well advised not to show your card uh, because that would prevent you from purchasing the firearm and potentially land you in significant trouble. Uh, but you know, you, you might also know that if you buy a gun from someone other than a gun dealer, if you buy in a private party sale, you don't have to fill out the 4473 form. So you never make any representation about whether or not you're an unlawful user of marijuana. Uh, that you know maybe clears one hurdle for you, but you're still a prohibited possessor. It, and, and I now, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So Finish I, that up. I, I, I think I have a follow up. There's like there's one more point that I want to make that I just think is important uh, in balancing your risk, and it's how do you if you're violating the law. Uh, what police agency are you likely to encounter and under what circumstances? Uh, it, it, is, it is true that state police can enforce federal law, but generally speaking, they don't. Uh, in Arizona, uh, you know, from my discussions with police officers here uh, about this issue, if you're stopped with a card and with marijuana and with a gun, uh, you're getting all of those things back. 
uh, and you're not getting charged because enforcement of this federal regime is not an Arizona enforcement priority, uh, typically speaking. Uh, so in that case, you really benefit from having the card because if you didn't have the card, you'd be getting a possession charge. On the other hand, uh, if you get stopped by a federal law enforcement officer, maybe Customs and Border Patrol here in Arizona would be the most likely one, uh, and you have a card in marijuana and a gun, uh, then you have committed multiple fellow federal felonies as far as they're concerned and committing a gun crime and a drug crime together uh, is especially bad. It enhances your sentence. Uh, so people should be should look into how the system works before they make a choice about uh, whether they're going to play by the rules strictly, you know, which of course they should because I'm a lawyer. But, you know, if they don't. <laughs> Now, I thought I saw something uh, that actually lumped in ammunition along with the firearm. So it, it doesn't matter if you go in there to buy ammunition or a firearm or both or any combination of. But uh, if they have a, a suspicion that, uh, you know, you are, uh, you know, of that, that marijuana persuasion, uh, that they can actually refuse you uh, for that. Uh, it's something that is that true. I mean, how does that work? You know, I think that may be a state law issue. Some states control uh, the sale of ammunition differently than other states. I don't think uh, that the federal law prohibiting possession of firearms speaks also prohibits uh, possession of ammunition, but I don't, I don't know that for a fact. I, I, also, many gun shops may have their own policies about this, internal policies. I would encourage anybody who has a card to never ever bring it to a gun shop and never talk about it. <laughs> if if I all, may, ever, Logan, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Title 18 of uh, the United States Code, Section 922, actually does uh, forbid uh, anyone who's an unlawful user from trip shipping, transporting, receiving, uh, or possessing firearms or ammunition. Or ammunition. So, yeah. So that is included um, in there. Obviously, it's sort of like, having one without the other doesn't make sense anyway. So if you're violating just for the possession of the firearms, unless you're into expensive paperweights, you're probably uh, <laughs> you're breaking the ammunition <laughs> part of that law too. Yeah, I, I've dealt with this in the context of firearms, but I haven't had an ammunition case come up. Uh, but good, thank you for correcting me. Not a problem. <laughs> So, so Adam, uh, just real quick, uh, you know, just to ask this question point blank, does having my medical marijuana card mean I can't purchase guns legally? Technically, yes. Yes. Can you expand upon that? Does that mean that I'm also unable to own firearms? Uh, yeah. I mean, so you, the, the federal law says that possessing firearms as an unlawful user um, of controlled substances is prohibited. So um, you, as Logan said, you really have to decide which, uh, where your passions lie. <laughs> are you going to be into marijuana, even if it's legal under the state's laws, or are you going to be into firearms? Or you just have to be particularly careful and hope that you never get caught for violating federal law. So on the other side of this, uh, what happens when uh, legalization you know, occurs yeah, I was, I was just going to ask that too. So just kind of <laughs> yeah. reaching out there, what happens when it becomes legal recreationally? So if that on a state by state basis, then the things that we're discussing here tonight don't change. Um, if the federal government were to go ahead and remove marijuana from the schedule one list of controlled substances, um, then I think it would change. Um, and, you know, but I would, can't I'm a little tongue tied because I don't really exactly know how the procedure for that would work. But to the extent that the laws prohibiting unlawful possessors of controlled substances apply to those substances which are on Schedule One, as soon as marijuana is removed from Schedule One, you no longer be a prohibited possessor of firearms or ammunition. Uh, but I'm sure that there are other laws on the books, and I'm going to look for the citations real quick um, that discuss uh, for. For example, they would have to change that 4473 form um, because if, a, if let's say they remove it from Schedule 1 and medical marijuana was legal in your state, 
but you didn't have a medical marijuana card. And so you were an illegal consumer of recreational marijuana. You'd still be perjuring yourself when you filled out that form, unless or until it became legal recreationally nationwide. Does that make so what sense? you're saying is step one is I need to get elected to Congress and get it off the schedule one list. You get a lot of votes if you could deliver that promise for sure. Two more years, we'll, we'll, we'll run in two years. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> oh, and I, I wanna add, if that happens, ATF probably will change that form pretty quickly because they already changed it once in response to state laws. When okay. states passing uh, the medical marijuana laws, they added a little warning on the form that said, warning, marijuana is still illegal under federal law, uh, no matter what you're saying. <laughs> uh, so I think if it changes under federal law, uh, that, that form will change quickly. Fingers crossed. Let's see. So what about uh, a CCW permit? Uh, you know, what if you have your CCW and you end up going and getting your uh, medical card? Uh, I don't think that's going to change much for you. Um, so if you get the CCW first um, and then you go get your medical marijuana card, uh, you know, sort of the same discussion that we've had so far would apply. Um, just because you have the CCW isn't going to change um, the legality of possessing both of the federal law. But um, to Logan's point, you know, to the extent that you're probably only going to encounter state law enforcement officers, having the medical marijuana card and having the CCW creates a presumption that you're legally in possession of both. And if it's not the law enforcement officer's priority to enforce that federal law, you may very well get away with it. But that's, you know, you have to determine what your appetite for risk is if you're gonna be engaging in behaviors where you could get caught with both at the same time. Well, and the other thing is, I think people tend to think of the medical marijuana card a lot like a driver's license. Like it's just part of a readily accessible state database uh, but you ought to think about it more like your medical records. I mean, so yeah, is it, it's a state database, but is it, it protected? Is it protected under HIPAA? It is protected. It is, yeah. Uh, okay. In Arizona, it's protected under state law as well. Okay. Uh, I, I mean, I think if you were stopped by a federal law enforcement agent with the card, uh, they could probably subpoena the state for records. Uh, as part of their criminal investigation, but the state is absolutely not sharing that database with uh, its own law enforcement officials or federal law enforcement officials. Uh, so it's not like, the, you know, an officer will ever look at you and see your driver's license and say, hey, I, I should plug this guy in and see whether or not he's a cardinal. See, I, I think there's a, a big misconception with people. Um, it's during my time as a highway patrolman, uh, People think when you, you pull them over that you know absolutely everything about them the moment you run their ID. You know about every speeding ticket warning, their fight with their mother, you name it, they think you know and have access to it, which the reality is, you know, if their license is suspended or not, maybe a warrant or two, you know, that's, that's it. We don't have access to anything else other than that. And, you know, but the, the misconception is that people think you have access to everything and you really don't, you know, you got to look at the ID, call the number on the back, you know, and, and run it like you, uh, you would, you know, anything else you get someone who's, who's on probation, you got to get their number of their probation officer, give them a call, you know, so, so I think the misconception with people is they think you have access to all that information and it's readily available to anybody. So. You know, that's an interesting point. Uh, I guess what I'd like to do is uh, kind of start wrapping this up a little bit, uh, but I'd like to open it up, uh, you know, to talk about, uh, you know, common sense best practices. You know, what are some of the, the things that you should be practicing, uh, you know, as far as safety anyway? Uh, you know, whether you're a cannabis user, uh, just a, a, a gun advocate, uh, you know, or, or whatever. What are some of those, uh, you know, things that you should be practicing, those common sense ideas? I have um, a really good idea for this. Just like you separate your types of ammo separate your marijuana from your ammo you know keep keep them keep them separate you know don't uh don't travel with both of them together you know until uh until federal law changes and and society you know updates it's it's always going to be a hassle and you know we fall into this trap you, you're going to need attorneys like you guys and and others to help to, to you know get you out of the trouble you got into or 
you know, or, or try to try to help defend you from making a mistake. And the, I think there's so many different laws and rules that are convoluted that people don't understand where they fit, you know, where, what they can do and what they can't do. And it, it gets confusing. And then you add state by state with everyone else having different laws. And if you go to travel, then you're really, really in a mess. So. <laughs> yeah. That, that's great advice. Go ahead, Logan. I would add to remember that TSA agents are federal agents. Uh, so maybe you're in Arizona with your medical card and you're gonna go skiing, you're taking a flight to Colorado and it's legal in Colorado. So you think, why not? Yeah, I'm legal in Arizona, I'm legal in Colorado. Uh, I'll just uh, you know, bring some of my favorite stash with me. Uh, if you get intercepted by TSA, uh, you're gonna be in trouble. Uh, it so matter that it's legal on, at the state level on either side. I will. I'll add to that a little bit. Uh, my my full time actual full time job is an airline pilot for a, for airline out here, and I pass through the cabin every once in a while. And you know the the cop comes back in me. I can smell it and kind of look look to see who has it. And they they went right through TSA with it. And you know sometimes TSA may say something. Sometimes TSA doesn't. You know it's kind of hit or miss. But um. It, it it definitely makes its way on the plane so yeah I, I think their job is not actually primarily drug interdiction at all i don't think so either <laughs> not at all find it they are federal law enforcement officials right right well i think that's true not just of the tsa agents but of so many of the law enforcement um personnel that you may encounter in all walks of your life that you know what it is that uh you were doing that got their attention may or may not be what their priorities are. And once they realize that you don't pose a threat or you're not interrupting the peace in, in whatever realm it is that they're tasked with protecting or have it in their heads that they should be protecting is going to dictate um, whether or not you walk away from the circumstances scathed or not. Right. Yeah. But I think, Great. you so, know, picking back in off of what ahead. Jeff said, um, other practical advice, I mean, I think. Uh, what you folks are doing with normal is huge. And uh, the more we can um, be active and write our Congress people and our legislatures or legislators and um, let them know how we feel on the issue and what we expect of them going forward is really important. Um, my personal opinion, um, not to get too ideological with you, but um, marijuana should be a source of revenue for the government. It should not be a, a line item expenditure. And we spend uh, hundreds of million, if not billions of dollars a year incarcerating people for nonviolent crimes and we could swing the pendulum in the other direction and use it as a source of revenue to fund uh, the you know, rebuilding of our in infrastructure and education and doing things that are much more constructive um, than punishing people for you know, doing things that don't hurt anybody really at all. And if they do, they only hurt themselves. So uh, I think that's really important. And then of course, you know, as Logan said early on in our discussion, you need to be selective about what you want to do because, um, you know, from a defense standpoint, God forbid you needed to use a firearm to defend yourself. Um, if you have a medical marijuana card or you're in possession of marijuana at the time, you better believe the investigators are going to figure that out. Even if it was a, you know, justifiable homicide and self-defense or justifiable shooting and self-defense. Um, and so, you know, you're putting yourself at risk. If you have firearms for anything other than hunting, if you have them for personal defense, you probably shouldn't be in possession of marijuana or a marijuana card under these circumstances because you do run the risk that you know you can end up in really hot water. And uh, that's a position that nobody wants to be uh, caught in. And as an elected official, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, we're, we're spending way too much money incarcerating people when we could be doing, doing a better good with what we have. And when it comes to talking to your elected officials, I go to DC a couple times a year. I meet with all our congressmen, uh, senators for Florida. Um, I actually run into them from Arizona and everywhere else across the across the country. But write them when write them letters, send them emails, call them, call them. I, I, I get to the point that they're going to block your number. That's the point you need to get to <laughs> to get through to them. And and another thing is you may not need to actually talk to them. Their assistance are more valuable than, than, than the actual elected official themselves because the, their, uh, their, their, their staff is who gets through to them. So if you can make that connection with one of their staff, call, voice your opinion over and over again, you know, 
If you have issues, call these people. That's what they're there for. They're there to help you. They're there to make the positive changes for our society. You know, they're not there to collect a check and sit in DC and do nothing. So um, I, I have all of their email addresses. I have all their phone numbers. I have their staffers' names and numbers. I call everyone. And when I call, I'm gonna sit down for four hours making phone calls and sending emails at the same time. Uh, they get pretty annoyed with me, but I actually get positive responses. So, um, and I'm in a nonpartisan position, which is great. Uh, you know, I'm on one party. I deal with with members of Congress and the Senate, you know, that are on other parties, and we can all get along and, and work for the better good. So, you know, don't don't draw right party here. lines here. Actually, call everyone. There's, you know, it works every side. There's there's always an option. So, you know, take the time and make the effort, and you can actually get places by doing it. So, either that or you get blocked by them. So. <laughs> <laughs> just like Jeff. No. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> I appreciate that. That was actually great advice as well. So, uh, gentlemen, uh, where do people turn when they have an issue? Uh, they could always turn to Arizona Normal or Southern Arizona Normal. But on top of that, uh, uh, feel free to reach out to Rose Law Group as well. Uh, Adam, would you like to expand or Logan? Um, yeah, our website is roselawgroup.com, R-O-S-E-L-A-W-G-R-O-U-P.com. And you can contact uh, Logan or I uh, by looking for our biographies under their, our, the team page or the About Us page. And um, you know, we'd be happy to help you through whatever issue it is that you're dealing with. I agree. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Uh, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Uh, looking forward to doing this again with you. I mean, it's been uh, absolutely. Uh, absolutely amazing. Thank and, you guys uh, for all you do. Thank and you again. Out. Yep. Thank you, Special Jeff, for thanks. taking the time out of your busy night as well. All right. And you with guys that, have a good uh, evening. Yep. And we're going to wrap up our uh, first ever episode of uh, Arizona Normal and Southern Arizona Normal's uh, educational series. And look uh, for many, many more. Night. We're cooking them up right now, <laughs> even as we speak. We're coming back to you. That's we're right. going to have our special guest back again. And we're going to start disseminating the information on a regular basis. Thanks, guys. Once again, pleasure. Right. Have a good night. Have Thanks. a good night.